Hello, this is Stephen. And this is Megan. And this is the Synchrony Podcast, where we talk about transforming apostolic dating culture and ending loneliness in the church. Nailed it first try. Thank you. How's your day been today, babe? A little lackluster. Yeah, you haven't been feeling so great. Yeah, my my tummy hasn't been feeling good. Sorry, tummy. That's toddler talk. <laughs> yeah, our bellies have been hurting. Yeah, when I'm talking to a group of my fully adult friends, and I'm like, I gotta go potty. I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, our vocabulary has just slowly, slowly shifted into just kid words. Yeah. I think, but that's okay. You know, it is what it is. It is what it is. We got any updates? Um, just to keep an eye out for us in person on May the 3rd, Friday, May the 3rd, uh, in Jacksonville at the Florida District Hyphen Rally. We're really excited about that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited just to see what the energy is like to talk to people about this in person. Yeah. Because, I mean, we've had like one-off conversations with people, but it'll be neat to just sort of have a big group of people that we can talk to and, and kind of get their, their, you know sense of how they feel about the project and what they think of it yeah um, it's gonna be funny yeah. i'm looking forward to it i'm also like nervous to see if people are going to receive it as well as we hope they do yeah for real that's that's definitely there um and hyphen like as a group is is only one sort of chapter of the folks that we serve yeah um so it's also not you know covering every potential you know population i guess within the synchrony project but i'm excited about it it'll be it's a nice sort of like soft entry point to doing more events and yep. seeing people in person so we're really grateful to the jacksonville church and the hyphen team for yeah. having us ocean's church not the jacksonville church there's multiple jacksonville churches <laughs> yeah yeah i should actually learn what the name of the church is because we always refer to them as the Olson's Church, but at some it's point like the Olson it's a Bible quizzing thing. Yeah, at some point, brother and sister Olson are going to get their well earned retirement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's true. We're gonna have to actually know what to call the church. If you're listening to us from the Olson's Church, we're sorry for not knowing the actual name of your church. Um, They'll anyway. forgive us, I'm sure. Yeah, I hope so. Okay, this is gonna be just a fun kind of chill episode. I feel like we've had a lot of like really deep hard hitting topics lately. Yep. So this will be a little bit easier. Yeah. We're talking about dates. Yep. Well, what kind of dates? Synchrony dates. Ooh. Yeah. Um I think that this is something that people have a lot of questions about but maybe don't know how to exactly frame it. Um because you know, this isn't, we don't put like a, a complete description of this, like on the website. Um, so it's not like it's just out there for people to read, but we want to basically just talk about what happens when you go on a date with someone that we've matched you with, um, and what those dates look like, because they happen virtually, which is kind of weird for most people to think about in terms of a first date. Um, so it, there was a period of time where we didn't even call them dates, like, I was calling them like synchrony conversations. Or... Yeah, it was kind of misleading though. Yeah. I mean, I still don't think date like perfectly captures it because date carries this connotation of like, you know, going to see if there's like a, a spark and going to do some kind of fun activity together. Or, like maybe there's a meal or. I think it's less of that. I think date kind of feels like it's date feels like commitment. Yeah. And yes, ultimately dating should lead to commitment if you guys feel comfortable with each other but we're not necessarily saying that every person that's going to be on one of these quote unquote synchrony dates is going to end up dating right exactly it's a very it's really more of an introduction yeah um it's a low key introduction so we kind of just want to like demystify that a little bit and talk about what happens you know behind the scenes so that people will know what to expect when they get matched all right. So I have a question for you. Yes, sir. What happens after someone has their consultation? Yeah, I guess that's a good place to start. So um, it, it's funny because usually during the consultation, my mind is already like mentally running through. Like imagine those like 
old, I say old fashioned. There's going to be people who make fun of me for calling these old fashioned, but like, you know, those like little like Rolodex, like address books or whatever. Uh, I, those probably qualify as old fashioned. I mean, they do now for sure, but there's going to be people who listen to us who are like back in my day. Yeah. Um, but like those were going out when we were kids. Yeah. Yeah. My parents had one for sure. And if you don't know what we're talking about, um, because you were raised in the age of the iPhone, this is like a a spinning deck of index cards, basically. Yeah. That would have people's name and phone number and contact information on them. And most people would have them in their like home offices or in their actual offices. And you would spin through them. You know, they're organized alphabetically to find the contact card of the person that you want to reach out to. Um, and it was just a quick and easy way to store your personal contacts before you had a contacts library in your phone. Yeah. Um, quick and easy, maybe not, but organized, yes. <laughs> I mean, quicker than like, you know, flipping through like a phone book. That's true. Um. Anyway, so I have like a mental one of those rolling through my head as I'm talking to somebody in their consultation. And I'm usually thinking like, okay, is there someone in the right group, you know, who's who I could put them in contact with? And like... I want to kind of demystify the matching part of this too, I guess. Like there's nothing magical happening behind the scenes of me, like, you know, hearing the voice of God and seeing an, the first name of your spouse written on the wall in front of me. And that'd be nice, but yeah, it doesn't happen that way. Um, usually what happens is I'm hearing you say some really key things about the people that you're interested in, the, um, kind of personality they need to have, the logistics of where they need to be. And I'm going through going like, okay, who do I have that would fit that criteria? And sometimes somebody immediately springs to mind. Yeah. Sometimes I have to go do some digging back through our database and I have to go look through a bunch of notes and figure out who would be the best fit. Yeah. Um, and kind of, it's, go it ahead. sounds like it's really contingent on the specifications of each person. Yeah, I mean, generally when I sit down to match someone and like full disclosure, I'm usually starting the match with a male respondent because. Oh, just because of the. Because we have so many fewer yeah. men than women. So it's much easier for me to go, OK, I have a man here who's looking who would be a good fit for him than it is to go in reverse. Right. So if I have a guy that I've consulted with who I think is ready to meet people. I'll look at his criteria, the logistics that matter for him, what he's looking for. I'll go look in our database and look at all the women who are in the appropriate age range for that man um, who have already done consultations. And we'll just go through and see, OK, is there anyone here who lines up well with what he's looking for, who wants the same things? Right. Yeah. And by then it gets to be a very manual process where I'm opening up their survey and looking at, you know, their preferences for parenting and how they feel about relocating and what kind of things they're involved in at church. And I'm opening up his survey and looking at the same thing and just kind of going back and forth, comparing and contrasting until I figure out if someone is mostly a good fit for them. Right? Yeah. And I tend to be on the side of introducing people if they're about like a 70% match. Yeah. Right. If if the big things are met in terms of their ability to live in the same place and their desire for children and, um, you know, their overarching ministerial goals, then I think that's something I mean, worth those are the big questions you really need to be. Uh, sorry. No, those aren't the quite big questions that you need to be concerned about only. But those are the big ones that we've talked about in the past on the podcast, like really make a difference mm -hmm. in terms of time saving. Right. Finding out those you know. big kind of deal breakers up front. Yeah. So if you can have, you know, three or four people at your disposal that are about a 70%, I would rather have three or four to choose from than one that's at a 90 every once in a while. Yeah. What I'll do then is like if there are any places where there is misalignment, and by that I mean this, you know, this person that's a closer fit doesn't match all of their criteria. You know, they might be like a little bit shorter than what they said they were looking for. Or maybe they, you know, don't have the salary that the other person was hoping for or something like that. Right. Yeah. Then I'll sometimes reach out and ask and say, hey, I have someone who's a good fit. This is the place where they don't quite align with what you were looking for. Do you still want to meet them and move forward? So it's not like a black and white thing where, you know, if they if they don't check 90 percent of your boxes, they get thrown out of the pile. Right. It's. 
I'll kind of go through and manually look to see where's their alignment, where is there not, and then come and ask you if there's any specifics that I feel like you should know about beforehand. Yep. So that's pretty much what happens before we agree to meet up. Okay. And then what we'll do is if both parties are like, yeah, let's meet this person, I'll send out a link to where they can go select a time. Um, and we'll find the time that works for all three of us because I've got to be there too for part of it. Um, and then we'll get that on the calendar. And while we're waiting for that to happen, I will start working on their bios if they haven't already had a date. Yeah. So the bios are basically one page documents, PDFs. Kind of like a, a cover uh, cover page for a resume. Yeah, kind, it's <laughs> kind of. It's like a it's sort of like a um like a personal statement, I yeah. guess. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, and and it's it's very high level. So we try not to put people's personal information out there in a way that would compromise their privacy. Yeah. Um obviously you have to exchange some information for the other person to feel like sure. you know, they're kind of going into something that they're in control of and feel safe about. But um, the, bi or the bio only contains uh, the person's first name, the state where they live, their age, and their occupation. So just very high level data about them. Um, and then a few sentences, usually like just a couple of paragraphs that kind of include what they're looking for and what they're about. And then a picture. Uh, which is <laughs> surprisingly where a lot of my time goes is <laughs> talking about the pictures. Yeah. Um, yeah. I explain that a little bit. So I always get the question and I don't always get the question. I often get the question during the consultation. Like, do I get to see what they look like before I make the decision to meet them? And the answer to that is no. You book the call with them first. We have reasons for this. The main one being that we're really trying to intentionally move away from Tinder culture. This, yes, yeah. yeah, sw swiping based off looks. Right, like seeing one photo of someone and making a values judgment about that. Um, I think it's just so like deeply entrenched in our culture to prioritize that first. Um, and honestly, I get I get people that are really nervous about that, like that the one photo is not going to be enough to get, to make them feel like it's worth pursuing. And, um, you know, people will ask me, like, if I don't like how they look, when I see their photo, can I back out? And it's like, I mean, yeah, if you want to. But, you know, why not just suspend your your immediate reaction first again it's going back to the this is not a committal date yeah like, like you're not you're is, not promising is, to to go visit someone or marry them yeah exactly so have an hour conversation with someone you didn't know before right but people are just very we're, it, it gives us a sense of security is yeah. what it is like photos and images because in normal dating today quote unquote normal dating you can go Facebook stalk someone and learn about their whole life. Yeah. You know? Creepy. It is. And it's but also, I, I mean, I say creepy. I'm guilty of it, but sure. All of us have done this. Yeah. But it's also fake. Like, let's just put that out there. When you are going to look at someone's curated, collected albums of photos, that's on of them online. You're not necessarily seeing a reflection of who they are as a person. No, you're um, seeing what they're choosing to be visible. Yeah. And what, and what friends have put out there sometimes about them or what, you know, where they show up in their community. It's not always a great indicator of what they look like just to begin with or who they are. Right. Yeah. So I have really strong feelings about not wanting people to base their decision of whether or not to go through with the date just on the photo alone, because I think that sells people short. Yeah. Um, and you know, I don't think, I think most people wouldn't want that to be done to them, right? To be judged off of a single image, you know? Yeah. But I ask for a photo because people do want to know what people look like. And I do think it is important for them to have an expectation of who they're going to see. It could be a photo or a one minute video, right? Or a couple second video. Yeah. I give people the option to do videos, but honestly, we haven't had, I think I've had one person submit one of those and 
we didn't even use it when that person got matched because it's just very difficult to like send that to like store it and send it in a form that it and it just it kind of oh, comes across okay. a little bit clunky like the document feels better just one cohesive document with a one picture in okay. my opinion but it's an option if there's anyone out there who absolutely hates how they look in photos and really just would feel so much more comfortable with a video we can try like that would be something yeah, we'd be open absolutely. to um, okay so we put those bios together um, I write up the text and I send it to the person to the the person that it's about so that they can review it and make changes. And then once we have it finalized, the day before the date, so usually about 24 hours in advance if I've got my act together, I will send out an email um, with both of the bios. The the two the matches are BCC'd, so they can't see each other's contact info, but they're seeing the same email. Um, and it basically says, hey, we're going to have a date tomorrow. Before you come in, um, here's a link to a guide. We have a document that we put together that basically just gives them some expectations about what the date's going to be like. And I can say more about that in a second because I think it kind of helps frame what the experience is like. And then links to those bio documents um, and just the instructions for how to join you know, I encourage them to make sure that their Wi-Fi is set up well, you know, that they've got their infrastructure in place. So it's a, a fun call for the other person. Yeah. Um, I've also been asking in the email for people to gather up some items. So at the beginning of the date, I do a little icebreaker activity. Um, I'm not going to go into specific details because that's kind of fun to keep as a surprise. But basically, I have them find some items from their life. I give them descriptions of those items. And they bring those into the call to do a, like a little show and tell at the beginning. And it's a nice way for people to kind of um, provide small details about themselves that are safe Yeah. to kind of just open up the conversation. Um, and it's fun because the other person gets to see a little bit about who they are and, you know, a kind of a peek behind the curtain of their life. Um, so that's what happens before the actual call. Okay. Of that description, you as sort of, I mean, obviously you've heard me talk about these a lot and you've seen some of them happen, so it's not like you're unfamiliar with them, but where do you feel like people would get the most kind of nervous in that process or like hesitant? Probably saying yes to the date. You mean like beforehand? Yeah, like be be like making the choice to say yes or no. Mm. I mean, that's if I had to put two and two together, but I don't know if that's the if that's where it is. I, mean, I haven't found there to be a whole lot of hesitation there unless I, I reach out with something that's like, hey, this person seems to be a really good fit for you, but there's this one thing that you specifically said you weren't looking for. Oh, okay. Usually, unless there's something like that, people are like, there's a match? Great. Let's try it out. You know? <laughs> that's true. Um, especially if, you know, unfortunately for my ladies, like most of the guys who are in the pipeline are either in the process of meeting their first match or um have already been matched with someone before like because guys i can usually i usually have at least a few people that i can introduce them to depending on their circumstances there's some guys in the pipeline who you know have very unique criteria that need to be met yeah um or just like logistical challenges that would make it difficult for me to find someone who's not in a very specific area yeah like that's where like needing someone to move or having to take care of a loved one or they have children. There's a lot of different factors. Right. So I'm, I don't want a blanket statement. Not every guy in the synchrony pipeline has been on multiple dates. No. Some of them haven't been on one yet and still looking guys, you know, have faith. But if someone has a very specific criteria, it will just take me longer to find someone that's a good fit. Yeah. Right? Anyway, all that being said, um, most of the time when I reach out, people are gung-ho to give it a try, especially if it's their first time going through the process, which I'm very grateful for because it is very brave to to embark on something like this. Um, but yeah, so that's the pre-date process. And then we have the date itself. All right. Do you want to cover that at all or do you want to save that for... No, let's tell people a little bit about like what happens. Like I want them to understand like what the experience is like in the call so that they can kind of envision it. So it's a virtual call. We do it over Google Meet the same way that we do our consultations. And all three of us join, you know, the two matches and myself. Um, and I introduce everyone just kind of lightly. And I start by setting some expectations at the outset of the call. The first expectation that I set usually gets some raised eyebrows, which is that 
we do not expect anyone to fall in love or feel butterflies during this one hour call. Yeah. We just don't. And why, I, why is that? So number one, it's a virtual call and the um, unconscious signals that humans key in on to tell them that someone's attracted to them or that there's interest, um, their physical presence that sometimes creates more of a quote unquote chemistry, those signals aren't as visible or available over a virtual call, right? Yeah. You're not standing in the same room with someone, seeing the space they take up in the room, seeing the energy that they're bringing to the group that they're with. They're not able to give the full body language right. that expresses interest or disinterest or any, right. any of those. And so much of that is unconscious, right? Like, yeah. you know, the the dating rituals that we have that we think about with human community that happen in person are very, very contingent on a series of unconscious body language signals. Yeah. Um, and researchers have studied this and it's really fascinating if you want to dive into that field like what things that humans do almost without knowing it um, that give the other person the sense of security. It's very much baked into just who we are as, as humans, as mammals, as, you know, primates, whatever um, to, to interact physically in that space and to key off of those signals. Right. So those aren't present for the most part in these calls. Yeah. Um, or if they are, they're kind of muted. Right. Um. So that's one factor where we don't really expect the chemistry to just take off over one of these calls. And the other thing is that I think that realistically, most of the time in, in people who do find partners on their own, that quote unquote chemistry, and I'm making air quotes as I say this, might not be there in their first interaction either. No. I interacted with you for years and felt nothing. Thanks. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just being honest. <laughs> no, I know. It's same for you, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, whenever I first met you, I was uh, still in a relationship. So, yeah, but I mean, like being in like, let's be real, being in a relationship with someone in a dating relationship doesn't mean that if someone that you're really attracted to spends time with you, like you don't sense that attraction. Oh, right? sure. Yeah. But we interacted for years. I mean, it helps that you thought I was like 15. So, yeah, I, I. I was not attracted to you when we when we first got to church together. No, right? I know. But I mean, like, that's like my point is the chemistry usually isn't immediate anyway out yeah. in the wild. A lot of times it takes, you know, lots of interaction with someone hanging out with the same friend group, experiencing them in different social settings. Yeah. Subtly learning about their values that key interests that make you want to get to know that person better yeah observing their sense of humor observing yeah. the you know the way that they interact with other people those things inform this idea of chemistry right yeah um and so you're not going to have that right this is a one hour call so we just lower the bar to start we just say like hey this probably isn't going to be a situation where either of you comes away falling in love it's fine if you do but that's not the expectation we're setting. And I usually tell them our goal here is to figure out if there's curiosity. Like if you come out of this call and you're like, Ooh, you know, this person was really interesting and I kind of want to know more about them. And maybe I could see myself talking to them more and enjoying that conversation. That's enough of a reason to, to move forward with the match and see what's there. Yeah. And like you said before, you're not committing to anything by that. Like, you don't if, if you say, yeah, I want to get to know them after this. It's not like you're committing to becoming their boyfriend or girlfriend. You're just saying, like, yeah, I want to talk to them some more yep. and see. So we set that expectation. We also, you know, I tell people that we agree as a group to give each other permission to ask really direct and straightforward questions. Yeah. So on a first date, normally... You don't, <laughs> except for you, because you're, you're the exception to the rule. Um, I think on a normal first date, we kind of shy away from those really, really super personal questions that would make people uncomfortable. But are the questions that you really need to know, like, do you plan to have children? <laughs> you know, yeah. how important is it to you to live close to your parents? Like, 
important questions that might not feel normal on a first date, we just give each other permission to ask those and make it awkward if we need to. Yeah. So that's kind of the ground rules. Um, and then we do that little sharing activity, which is really fun. And it's usually just like three or four items that I've asked them to bring and talk about. So that takes like five or 10 minutes, maybe yeah. depending on how interesting the items are and how funny they are and just what kind of stuff that they do, you know? Uh, and then I get ready to leave. So I usually put um, a, a topic in the chat, in the video call, like just like a very high level, you know, hey, find stuff you have in common or you guys are really aligned on this. Maybe talk about that just to kind of prompt some conversation to help them fill up the air just in case the conversation doesn't flow naturally. And then I leave for like 45 or 50 minutes while they talk. <laughs> okay. And what's the expectation while you're gone? Like for me? No, for them. Well, I know you, I know what you're doing. You're freaking out on the other end. But... Yeah. I'm just sitting there like, I'm usually trying to do work, but I'm usually super distracted and like <laughs> yeah. thinking about whether or not it's going well and nervous about how it's going and like hopeful that it's going well. And I'm like twiddling my thumbs and yeah. Yeah. Or dealing with a unhappy toddler. Yeah. Yeah. Because I have that big break. Sometimes I can go do other things, but yeah. All right. So you come back after 45 or 50 minutes, then what? Um, so I usually, what's, what's funny, the, the best and worst part of these dates is that I'm beginning to be able to tell how it's going to go as soon as I drop back into the call. Uh, yeah. Like what they're going to decide to do, right? Because what happens after the date is that, um, you know, they've I ideally learned everything they need to know about the other person during that conversation that would help them make the decision about whether or not they want to get to know them better, right? Um, so they don't know everything about them, but they've they've hopefully learned enough in the course of that hour to have a gut sense of like, is this person someone that I would want to talk to more or not? Usually when I get back into the call, I can immediately tell if they were having a really good time or if it was just kind of something that they were like making conversation in. Yeah. You know, there's like an energy in the room, quote unquote, like the, the virtual room. Yeah. Um, and, you know, usually if people are laughing, genuinely laughing or smiling a lot, um, that's usually a good sign that they, they, you know, identified some interest and it felt like it was going to go well. Not always. Right? Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so I, when I get back in the call, I give them one last chance to, ask difficult questions. So I'll say like, Hey, is there anything that you haven't had a chance to talk about yet that you feel like is really important for you to know, um, in order to, to decide whether or not you want to get to know them more. The best calls are the ones where people use that opportunity to ask some really hard hitting questions. Yeah. Um, it leads to some really great vulnerable conversation so yeah. I love it when I see people just like stepping into that, you know. Well, what's cool about, sorry, this is a little side note. I'm, I kind of geek out about this kind of stuff. Yeah. Because the big part of our marriage that's been so valuable to us mm. is us having the ability to ask hard questions or talk about hard things with each other. Yeah. And what's so cool is these people are getting to see this person that they're talking to's ability to have those hard questions. Mm. And what's so cool is they can start their relationship on the foundation of communication. Yeah. That's really, really important that um, if they decide to move forward and get to know each other more, and if that progresses into a dating relationship, they've gotten the big things out of the way. Yeah. Right? And they've set the standard, like you said, of, of being really direct with each other. Yeah. I'm um, giving each other permission. I, I think the other thing that's really important is that when we give the other person permission to ask us hard things and we provide honest answers and we know that that's reciprocated, 
it creates this amazing feeling of safety. Yeah. Um, Google did a whole project about this related to work. And I guess, I don't know if they coined this term, but I don't think they did. But the, the term psychological safety was one that they talked about a lot, right? Which is the um, basically the ability to make interpersonal mistakes or um, social, you know, create like social challenge or, or awkwardness and still be accepted. Yeah. And when we give someone else the permission to do that in this call, especially if you're someone who has really struggled with dating because of just how nerve wracking it is. Right. Yeah. Or if you're in a relationship before where you got in trouble for asking hard questions. Right. Or where there was a lot of smoke and mirrors. Yeah, you know, exactly. They, I, I've worked with a lot of people who um, were taken advantage of in prior relationships or were, you know, dealt with a lot of dishonesty and they're on the part of their, their former partner. Yeah. Um, so giving them that clarity at the beginning, I think, is really important and builds a sense of trust, you know. It, I, sorry, Megan and I also coordinate FPU or Financial Peace University of Dave Ramsey's uh, courses mm. on occasion. And this is the same concept to me that you see a light in couples' eyes and in their personality and in their relationship that just like, shines so bright when you see them all not have an ability to talk about money and then go through this course and by the end of it they're able to like have a legitimate real deep conversation about money yeah. that they never had the ability to communicate before about and you see this like like this link and this like growth in that, in their relationships. That's so beautiful. And I think that's one of the things I love about FPU in general is you're giving people the groundwork to be able to communicate mm -hmm. again with this going back to synchrony. I think that's what I am excited for people is they're starting out the relationship saying, Hey, I want to be able to have hard conversations. Yeah. Not all the time. That's exhausting. Right. But have the ability to say, Hey, I want to communicate with you about said topic that's really important to me. Let's yeah. talk about it. So, and I mean, the great thing about this is like, you know, obviously I wish every time two people met in a synchrony call that they identified each other as a great match and they wanted to move forward. Yeah. Realistically, that doesn't always happen. No. And it often does not happen on the first try for me. Mm -mm. Like, I found that it usually takes me a couple of of rounds of matching someone to start to hone in on what they're really looking for. So if you've only been on one synchrony date and you're listening to this, please be patient with me. You know, yeah. it's going to take some time, but I was looking into stats of matchmaking in general. Um, not just apostolic matchmaking, but globally. And I was seeing there's an average of about eight to 10 matches before they actually found someone that they wanted to move forward with. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, and, I, and I know that's a, that's a, that's it's comparing it, apples to oranges, but not really. I mean, I, I mean, it, I'm, I'm wanting to, I'm saying this to set expectations. Yeah. Because if you go into this saying, I'm going to try once or twice and if it doesn't work, I'm done. Then you're kind of selling yourself short. Right. Cause every time I, take someone through one of these dates i'm learning a tremendous amount yeah you're about... fine-tuning your search parameters right but the other benefit besides that it, even if it doesn't result in somebody matching yeah is that people tend to learn a lot about themselves going through this yeah so i've had people come to me after going through a date even one that didn't result in them matching with someone for the long term going wow having this conversation with someone gives me a sense of what I'm really looking for and being able to see someone who fits a lot of my criteria and understand what I do and don't like about them. And it, it just helps me understand what I'm looking for better and gives me more of a language for what to use. And there have been people that have come out of one of these conversations and gone and found someone in their local area or at an opportunity that they wanted to start dating. Yeah. And that's nothing magical from us right it's just no like, it's it's going back to the fpu right comparison you're we're hopefully giving them the understanding of how to talk about money right 
So now you can go and find someone with the same values about money. In FPU. Yeah. In FPU. Yes. So in this situation, hopefully there should be, there could be some tools that are fine tuned to be able to find someone who has a like values, but also ability to communicate about your relationship, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Yeah. And I don't mean to harp about this particular group of synchrony respondents, but I'm going to go back to the people who told me that they haven't seriously dated who are coming into this as their first real dating experience, right? Humans are very much like repetitive creatures, right? We like to see an example of something being done before we do it. And, you know, we like to, to watch someone demo before we attempt something ourselves. Um, this is a very low key way to walk someone through a values driven dating scenario where you identify the most important things about someone and you ask them direct questions and you cultivate alignment. And that's a great template to give someone to go use out in other dating spaces. Yeah. Um, so I'm, it's, it's always exciting when I come away from these and people are like, man, that one didn't work out, but I learned a whole lot and I'm really excited to try again, or I'm excited to take this into different areas. Cause like, once again, our goal is not for you and I to be the avenue through which people find someone. Our goal is to end loneliness. Yeah. Whatever form that takes is okay. Mm -hmm. So we're just excited that people are adding tools to their toolkit. Um, but I also do love it when people actually match. Oh, 100%. So after the date, people have asked me like, okay, do I have to, is this like the bachelor where at the end I have to like say in front of the other person whether or not I want to move forward, right? That would be awkward as I'll get out. That would be awful. Yeah. I would, I can't handle cringe. Like, <laughs> I don't know how you married me then. I know. <laughs> the Lord be testing me. Um, <laughs> tribulation worketh patience. No, like I, like I can't watch like really cringy, like comedy movies or sh like i just get so angsty about it i want to just crawl out of my skin and hide somewhere right so no i will never put anyone through that awkward difficult situation of rejecting someone in front of them yeah and plus our goal is safety yeah you know and i'm not, I'm not talking about physical safety i'm talking well that is our goal of ours but um psychological safety you right. know and basically saying we want you to be able to talk to people and get to know people that you would have never otherwise met mm -hmm. and also feel safe to say no. Absolutely. Because we want you to be honest and say no if you if it doesn't feel like it's something you want to move forward with. Yep. It's also important, I think, for people to take a little bit of time to reflect because yeah. they're probably not, again, feeling attraction to this person yet. Yeah. Sometimes people find each other really attractive in the first call. That's great. Right. But it doesn't always happen. And sometimes, you know, people need to go away for a little while and sit with the experience. Yeah. So I actually tell them, okay, like everyone's going to go sleep on this talk. And I don't reach out to them again until usually like sometime middle of the next day. So I'll send out an email and it basically just says like, you know, answer these, answer these questions for me. Question one is like, do you want to get to know this person better? Question number two is like, if not, tell me why so I can use that information to better understand who to who to match you with next. And then the third question is like, give me any feedback about the experience and tell me what you liked and didn't like about it and be really brutally honest with me. And honestly, that's been some of the biggest help for us. Oh, yeah, it's been huge. When people are super clear with us and transparent and honest, it helps us change the process and mold mm -hmm. it and add or take away things. Um, which is why we're talking about this whole process and what's being done now as of April 21st, 2024. <laughs> yeah. Um, but going forward, it could be tweaked or changed a little bit on the processes of how things are getting done. But as of right now, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And, and I think we're always going to be iterating on it and making it better based on the feedback that we get. But, um, yeah. So I wait for those emails. So what happens after mm -hmm. those emails? Uh, so I send out the emails and then I watch my phone like <laughs> a hawk and insane. It's morning. really funny when you send out the emails and emails come back immediately. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, <laughs> like, uh, 
Yeah. I know. I, this, like, I don't want to oversell it to you guys because I know that the suspense for people that are waiting on a response from someone is much higher than what I'm experiencing. Oh, sure. But I am at the edge of my seat. Waiting well, you're to invested. See. I'm really invested. And sometimes, yeah. like, especially if I felt like the conversation went really well, you know, yeah. I'm like, oh, man, like, this could be really great for them. Yeah. This is like watching Megan do the matches is really funny because I watch her. Sit in angst for like hours and hours on end sometimes oh, because I've, I've especially cried yeah especially if it's a really good date like and you, and you can tell by the end of it that both people really enjoyed themselves yeah uh, Megan is just sitting on the edge of her seat the whole time yeah I'm I've, I've I'm sure like, right now this is like a business but it, there's not much of a difference for her in terms of investment I think the reason why I get so invested in these is because I I get this privilege to kind of have this window into their lives and their world when I get to know them in their consultation and when I get to work with them. Right. Yeah. That's really cool. And when they match with someone who I think aligns on their values and wants to build the kind of life that I know is important for them, I get so excited. Like, Sometimes it's because I know that it's this is a single parent who might have a chance to provide a um a you know married family home to their children. Yeah. Or it's someone who has a very specific and um deep calling on their life that they feel so passionately about who had kind of like despaired whether or not they were going to be able to do that in partnership. So when I can match someone and they they see it, they see why this person is right for them, it just like, I can get kind of overwhelmed with it. Like I get really excited thinking that that we might be getting to the point in, in their story where things change for them. Yeah. So yeah, so I wait for those emails to come back and... There are three outcomes generally, right? Both people want to get to know each other better. Both people don't or one does and one doesn't, right? Um, so in the scenario where both people want to get to know each other better, which is like obviously the one that I'm most excited for, I then put both of them in an email thread and with, where they can see each other's emails. Um, and I say, congratulations, you guys matched, you know, from here on out, like, please, you know, feel free to talk in whatever way makes sense. You can continue this email thread. You can exchange cell phone numbers, whatever you feel comfortable with. But, you know, feel free to to take up conversation and there's no pressure to be officially dating them. I lay this out in the email, right? You're just getting to know each other better from here. Keep asking those hard hitting questions. Let me know how I can support you. And they go off to start talking and I don't just leave them out to dry. Like I, I'll check in with them, but from then on, it's really about them reaching out and communicating in whatever way they feel comfortable. The second option where neither of, of them want to continue talking. Usually it's very amicable. I, I haven't had a situation yet where anyone was like, that was awful. And I don't, and I never want to do this again. Yeah. Right. It's usually like this person was really nice. I can tell they're not for me, but you know, I'd like to meet other people, but I really appreciate their time and it's very kind and um, that's great. So I'll let the other person know that the other person didn't want to move on and, and I'll just start looking again for both of them and we go on from there. The hardest situation is when one person does and one person doesn't yeah. want to keep talking. And that's happened a good number of times. Oh, sure. Naturally. Right. Um, and in those scenarios, you know, people often want to know why. The other person doesn't want to keep talking and I'll tell them, you know, respectfully and and kindly if it's something that I think is going to benefit them to know. Um, a, a lot of times it's just that, you know, the person didn't feel like this was the right fit for them. Yeah. You know? um, and it's as simple as that. And then we move on. But that's pretty much how how it happens at the end. So, yeah, that's kind of the before, during and after highlights what questions do you think people are going to have after that description um how many marriages have we had <laughs> yeah that would be a big zero 
but <laughs> yet. Yeah. Just a reminder, guys, like this is the long game, right? Yeah. Most people, because I ask people often like what their expectations are for how long they should be dating before they get engaged. And most people are like, eh, between six months to a year. Yeah. Right. We started this last July. Yeah. And we did not immediately have matches because. No, I think it wasn't until like December we had a match, right? Uh, maybe like October, November. But yeah. it, it was it was later in the year because it took us a long time to get guys. Oh, yeah. So, you know. Really, we didn't start putting people into matches until the end of last year. Yeah. So we just got to wait for relationships to flourish and <laughs> and go from there. But they'll start rolling in. Yeah. And, you know, I mean. And no pressure to the people who are currently talking continually still to this point. Yeah. No. It's, you know, it's a I mean, process. We're invested. But no pressure. Yeah, we check in with people, you know, we make sure and, and there's people like we've talked about who will start talking after they match. And then after a little while, they're like, yeah, this person's not it. Right. Yeah. Also, and totally that's OK. Fine. Yeah. And that's the that's the thing is like. We want this to be a resource mm -hmm. for you to be able to meet people. That are like minded. Similar values and that you would have never otherwise met before. Right. So I think that it's. I think giving someone the ability to feel like they can say no mm -hmm. and find another match is also a valuable resource. Yeah. Because, and I'm not saying I want people to break up <laughs> or not talk to each other. What I'm saying is sometimes people stay in relationships because they feel like they have no other option. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want people to feel that way. No, we avoid, we try to avoid the scarcity mindset, right? Like yeah. this might be my only chance, so I better talk to this person for a long time like no when yeah you figure i've already out, invested a year and a half into this person and i don't i'm getting older and i don't want to invest into anyone else because i don't have time to travel and go meet someone like it's, well, it's yeah. there's I mean, a lot of specifically with synchrony though yeah like we encourage people to like move on quickly if they feel like it's yeah. not it right yeah. and and we don't think that that's unkind mm -mm. like the other person wants to go find someone too right? yeah so figure no out one, what, no one likes anyone wasting their time right so figure out what you need to know and when you know enough to make your decision, make it quickly. Yeah. And we'll help support you to make sure that it's kind. You know, people sometimes come back and ask me like, hey, I need to tell this person I don't want to move forward with this anymore. What's the kindest way to do that? Yeah. And I can help troubleshoot that with them a little bit. Um, but yeah, we're not in the business of, of putting anybody in situationships. Mm -mm. No. So. All right, guys. Well, that is the high level of what synchrony dates are like. Uh, I hope that answers some questions. If you have more questions about it, you can send them to us at questions at synchronyproject.com. And yeah, we'll see you guys, some of you guys at least, in May. May 3rd. Yep. Hey, babe. Yeah. I love you. I love you too. I'm excited to be going to events soon with you. I know. We get to go be married in public. Together. I know. I feel like we don't get to be married in public a lot anymore. No, we just get to be parents. In yeah, public. I know. So now we're just chasing. It's like herding cats everywhere. But... Yeah, I don't want to talk badly about our children, but they are wild. Oh no, I love them, but I feel like every parent that has a two-year-old and a four-year-old would also agree that it's like herding cats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I'm. I've like been. I'm like so looking forward to this weekend of this hyphen rally not just because we get to go do an event for the first time but also because it's going to kind of be like a date yeah, <laughs> like yeah. this is now our version of going out for the weekend and hanging out and like babe you want to go booth a synchrony yeah uh, for synchrony let's do it absolutely i think it's going to be awesome so All yeah right, guys well thank you for listening and we will see you guys soon bye everyone <laughs>